Hello and welcome to the Toledo Lucas County Public Library Sight and Sound Video History Series. I'm Tom Walton. I'm really looking forward to our conversation today with a woman I've known for many years, a true political pioneer here in Lucas County, a woman who achieved many firsts for her gender and who remains one of the most popular and best known politicians, public figures in this region over the last generation. She is Sandy Eisenberg, the first woman ever elected to the Lucas County Board of Commissioners. And Sandy, it's always great to sit down with you. I'm looking always. forward to our conversation today. I am too. I am too. Um, be nice. I'll try. Okay. Up to a point. It'll be a point. It'll be a first. <laughs> we'll get into the political stuff in just okay. a little bit, but uh, first let's talk about your childhood. Okay. Uh, you were born in Detroit. Yes. 1939, the yes. daughter of immigrants. Yes. Your father was a Russian, was right. Russian. Your mother was Polish. Let's start with them. Can you talk a little bit about your dad and mom, Harry and Ann Welch? Sure. Uh, my father came to this country uh, when he's probably about eight or nine years old with his mother and his sister. Uh, his mother in those years, it, divorce was never heard of in a Jewish family, of course, and his mother was divorced, Rose, but remarried back here in Toledo to a man by the name of Welch. My father's real name was Brinkman, uh, Philip Brinkman, and married a man by the name of William Welch and uh, had two more children and he was the oldest of the four, and he adopted his stepfather's last name. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> worked hard, uh, went to school, uh, did not finish high school. I don't even know if he got past the first year of high school. Uh, but he worked hard, he worked for his uncle in a grocery store as a young man growing up, and then he and his mother opened a men's store when he's like 18, 19 years old. And he had Welsh's clothing store, and one was on 14th and Woodruff. One was on Franklin and Woodruff. One was on Cherry Street, not all at the same time, but over a period of years. Well, your mom was living in Detroit, I believe, and yeah, your father came, was in Toledo. How did they meet? Uh, it's cute. My mother came with her sister, um, from Warsaw, where they were well-to-do, large family, uh, t uh, ten children. Um, then when the Germans started uh, early on in the early, th uh, late 30s, early 30s, excuse me, uh, several of her brothers went to Argentina. Uh, her si oldest sister went and lived in what was then Palestine, which is now partitioned as of Israel. Um, and the rest of them migrated to Detroit. And my father's family originally, when they came over on the boat, they originally stayed in Boston, but they had relatives in Toledo and in Boston that brought them here, the Kripke family. And um, so my father was supposed to get fixed up with my mother's one-year-older sister and he didn't like her, but he certainly liked my mother, who was the youngest, and very much so the prettiest of all the girls. Uh, and um, they met, and they got married, and they got married November 20th, 1938, and I was born October 1939. Do you remember much about your neighborhood in Detroit, your, your house in Detroit? No, we didn't have a house, I think. And it's interesting because when my, my parents moved here, they lived in an apartment, I think, on Vermont Street, small little apartment. When my mother was pregnant with me, they always told me the story how they used to walk down to Walgreens, which was across the street from LaSalle and Cook, so my mommy could have orange juice for her boopsie, <laughs> me. And, um, but she was the youngest, and so she went to Detroit to have her first baby and stay there for three months. But other than uh, remembering visiting in, in young years, I, there was nothing that I really recall. So what was your first neighborhood My recollection first neighborhood here in recollection, we lived at 338 Columbia Street, which they've recently torn down. I think Local 500 bought that property, and hmm. after a while it was left in disrepair, and they tore it down. Now, you had two sisters? I have two sisters. Can you talk about your siblings a little bit? Sure. Uh, my middle sister, Arlene, was born July 4th. And my sister Barbara, uh, Arlene Frankel, uh, married a young man from uh, Cincinnati. They had one son, 
Uh, unfortunately, she passed away several years ago. And my sister Barbara is the youngest, and I can remember when my father brought her home from the hospital. And he shipped both my two sis my sister and myself outside. He'd bought a sandbox. My father was really something because he didn't buy a ready-made sandbox. He had somebody make a sandbox and deliver it with sand. And this was at an apartment building, but he wanted it for his girls. So we brought home Barbara, and uh, of course she was the youngest. And uh, where did you? Where in the world did he put a sandbox in an apartment? In the backyard. <laughs> it was in the backyard. Now you've always been close to your siblings, and yeah. uh, you still honor the memory of your sister. Yes, uh, my year, sister right? Arlene. Yes. Uh, well, in the Jewish religion, there's always a memorial service. You do that so, every year. Yeah, we do it every year. But believe me, I think about her a lot more than just once a year. I bet you. But do. we, you know, we do the same thing for our parents. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. Barbara and I and Alan and Ben usually go now, to the synagogue. Speaking of your, of your father, um, several years before you were even born, he underwent a harrowing experience oh, in yeah. Chicago. He was kidnapped. Yes. Can you talk about that? Well, we were never supposed to know about it. You know, those are the things you didn't talk about. But uh, he was also written up in. Uh, that detective magazine, remember the old days they used to have detective magazine? And what happened was he went to buy, when they were buying clothes, you know, so unfortunately he was looking for a great deal and evidently he ended up with some guys in the mob. And uh, so they kidnapped him because they wanted, the, these guys saw him and they knew what was going on, that he had some money but not a lot. But it's a great story, it tells you how People's families and lives are so integrated because my grandmother and he had a code. Now this is going back a long time. They had a code that if there was either one of them was ever in trouble, they would say, you know, uh, well, you might want to talk to Mr. McCluskey. Well, the man's real name was Margalevsky, but they changed it when they came to this country. It's McCluskey. So he happened to be a captain on the police force. I think it was a captain. So that meant something. Yeah. Wrong. So he called my grandmother and uh, well, they tortured him. He had marks on his face after a while and uh, said, uh, you might want to send um, uh, Mr. McCluskey with this ransom money. So my grandmother knew he was in trouble. So they found they picked up these two guys in a in a restaurant someplace, and uh, and he came home. And it's funny because Mr. McCluskey, Captain McCluskey, happened to be Sue Rio's grandfather, and Susan Rio worked for me and with me in the recorder's office when I became the first woman recorder. But wait, there's more, and her mother work with my ex-husband in the city tax office. Her mother's name was Susan Bowman. And we never knew any of this. <laughs> I mean, how small is Years this later, world? You'll... Years later, a generation later. It was just. Uh, speaking again of your mother, Ann, for a moment, uh, Sandy, she passed away in 2004. Yeah. And the family's obituary notice in the blade called her, quote, a liberated woman before her time. She was. Which she passed along to her daughters. That had to be a special gift to you. Yeah, she, um, she was a terrific, I mean, she was a dynamic woman, beautiful woman. We had a friend that called her Francesca because she had beautiful blonde hair and she always kept a nice figure and she dressed beautifully. Um, but she believed that women are, are equal in, in how you see things and how, how you do things. And uh, she was 16 years old when she was working for my uncle in Detroit. He owned a dress shop. And she's 16 years old. You know, she's only been here about probably eight, five years, six years. She's doing the windows in the dress shop. She's, you know, selling literally the clothes off her back to these women that came in and said, oh, I want that dress. Um, he had a dress store on uh, Dexter. Maurice's dress shop on Dexter. I have one cousin and another her and my cousin Susan's mother, who is my cousin Ida, but we always called her Aunt Ida. And she's still alive and she's 96. Wow. Now you attended uh, Glenwood 
and Old Orchard Elementary Schools, yes. I believe. Do, what do you remember about that period in your life, your elementary school years? Uh, well, I will tell you that there were only three Jewish kids in all of Glenwood School, <laughs> and let me tell you, that wasn't real easy. In what way? Uh, I don't know. I think that they, yeah, they, they didn't know too many Jews. Mm -hmm. You know, because most of the Jews lived on the other side and went mm -hmm. to Fulton School. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it wasn't easy. They made fun. They made cracks. They made remarks. Um, but I survived it all. And I, there's still people that I remember from mm -hmm. Glenwood School. I can remember sitting at a fundraiser for John McHugh when I first started working for John and Jack Lasky walks in and he says, I'd like you to meet my wife, Raleen. I hadn't seen the woman in 30 years. And I turned around and I said, Raleen Abbott. And she said, Sandy Welsh. <laughs> All those years ago. All those many yeah. years, yes. Did you, uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, occasionally get in trouble with your teachers? Yes. Were you kind of talkative and outspoken? Yes, I can't I imagine such a thing. but. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's really funny. The only time I ever got in trouble, I would end up in the corner. Miss Welch, in the corner, the principal would walk in. I swear, happened three or four times. Happened at Glenwood School, happened at Old Orchard School. Never yeah. happened at DeVilbus. I'm sure they would like to have had me do that, but I think that they were a little you, more. You moved on to DeVilbus. Uh, yeah. Of course, which doesn't exist anymore. Talk, can you talk about DeVilbus High School and the, that, those High formative school. years for you? I want to say, so, can I go back and say something sure about the can. education system, which I don't think has changed a heck of a lot, mm -hmm. which I'm sorry to say, but I'm a product of Toledo Public Schools. When I went to Glenwood School, we were doing <coughs> A, B, C, I mean, up until the late seventh grade, okay? Come to Old Orchard School. I had no idea what they were talking about at Old Orchard School. They were talking about uh, prepositions and pronouns. We didn't do that at Glenwood School. They were talking about social studies mm. on, on issues and mm. countries, etc. I knew nothing about. They were talking math that went right here and out there. <laughs> um, and because my initial was W, at the, I sat at the back of the room. I was so grateful, except she always call, they always called on me because they tried to shrink. I, on many occasions, I did not know. And I don't know if it's because of the social economic difference <laughs> between Old Glenwood School sitting in the middle of basically the central city mm -hmm. and Old Orchard School into a much more affluent area and neighborhood. So inequality. And that always bothered me, mm -hmm. very, very unequal. Mm -hmm. And it always bothered me. And when I would talk to people today, and I used to go to these schools and give speeches, it wasn't much different. And that just absolutely kills me because I think kids deserve an education that is equal. I mean, why shouldn't the kids in Toledo Public Schools get the same kind of education that my grandkids get in Ottawa mm -hmm. Hills? Mm -hmm or my grandkids would get in Savannah Township Schools or Anthony Wayne Schools. I don't think that that's right. So there's, there's an inherent problem in the system. Mm -hmm. And it's not the pay of the teachers, but there's something not quite right when the kid in the central city who could do well doesn't have the same kind of opportunity Not getting the same level as of Susie Smith living over there on Sheltonham mm -hmm. or Goddard Road or whatever. But you ended up at uh, DeVilbus. I and, loved uh, DeVilbus. Loved, you really enjoyed your years at DeVilbus. I Vilbus. loved my years at DeVilbus. The first year I didn't get it. We had high school, high school sororities and fraternities and I didn't get in my first year. And I was very hurt. It really crushed me because a lot of my friends got in. But I got in the second year. And I sort of found myself in my sophomore year. Mm -hmm. And I had wonderful, wonderful teachers. I had Mr. Mills. Uh, I had Buddy Leininger. If you ever went back into the annals of old Vilvis, he was the manager for the football team. Mm -hmm. He was a pistol, a little short guy. Uh, he was a hysterical guy. I mean, lousy teacher. He's gone now, so I can say that. <laughs> but, I mean, I, you know, those coaches were uh, Tom Hardy, you know, uh, Inman, Tom mm -hmm. Inman, um, Doc Good, you know, all the old coaches at Mur Hilton Murphy. 
was oh, sure. the leader, my friend Hilton. And, uh, but I sort of came into my own, as I was saying. And, and what, what do you mean when you say you felt you came into your own? I felt, I think, much more comfortable in my skin. Mm -hmm. I was very funny. <laughs> And had a good sense of humor, and uh, loved Elizabeth Paps and Doctor and um, uh, oh, I'm having a brain drain right now. What was his name? But you found your voice. I found Even my voice. Even though you knew, I did lousy in math because the instructor was a pervert. Today he would not be allowed to teach in public schools, and probably would have been locked up many years ago. And all the girls felt the same way, and I sat in the back of the room, and he would just come and, you know, his hand would be, anyhow. Well, what but was I knew his brother later on in life, and his brother was a very nice man. He was a lawyer when I worked mm -hmm. at the recorder's office. So what were your favorite subjects at Develop? English and history. English and history. Not surprising. Mm -hmm. And uh, could not, did lousy in math because of the instructor and probably because I was, I closed off. Algebra 1, flunked it, went to summer school, got an A in it from a wonderful man by the name of Mr. Brown. Went to Scott High School in the summer for summer school. Mm, what a difference the instructor makes. Huh? Yeah. And then I flunked Spanish because I really didn't like the teacher and she was my homeroom teacher and that's the way it went. Ms. Well, how Schmidt. did you feel when Devilbus High School closed years later? I was incensed because I was an elected office holder at the time. And I sent them all letters, and the board was all Democrats. They never acknowledged the letter. They never acknowledged that I was even interested. I sat in the front row when they voted to close the school, and I thought to myself, and then they took the roof. This, now, this is a roof story. <laughs> a, a, not a good roof story, but a roof story, as we all know my roof story. Um, they had a slate roof, and the building, the Vilbus building, is a huge, huge, huge building covered mm -hmm. in gorgeous, gorgeous slate. That building was built beautifully. And they shoveled the roof off, literally just shoveled it off, because over the auditorium and over the gym, it leaked. Well, when they had a memorial for Hilton Murphy, the roof still leaked, and they had never fixed the auditorium, nor had they ever fixed that one area in the gym. Mm. But they shoveled off all that slate that they had brought in. It made me sick. And then they put up this green yuck. So as you graduated from Develbus. What happened next? Did you go to work right away or go on no. to college? Are you kidding me? I was the world's worst. My father, I, I worked downtown at Lion's Store. At Christmas, and I loved it at Christmas. I helped. I remember helping this one wonderful Italian lady who nobody wanted to wait on her, and she had a list like this long. And I worked in the men's department selling and men's my, clothes. Right, and I and I had worked in my father's stores. Mm -hmm. I was a cashier. You know, I fixed up the shirts, whatever. He had stores. By then, he had a store at 421, 423 Jackson Street, which is now a parking lot, which is a lot of places downtown that are parking lots, and. Uh, so she gave me the list, and I said, oh, I'll be happy to help you. Well, an hour and a half later, I rang up two, you know, you had to write them in those days. You didn't, there was no computer. I rang it up. It was like $1,100. We're going back to 1957. She came back and gave me a big candy bar. She says, you were the only nice girl that would wait on me. <laughs> and uh, so then I went to um, Ohio State, which that's where you went because you went in education to look for a husband. And nice Jewish girls went to college to look for Were your intention to be a teacher at that point? No, are you kidding me? I'm a terrible teacher. Ask my kids. <laughs> um, no. So I didn't do very well at Ohio State. And then my father, and I came back home and I went to UT. And I did very well at UT. But I didn't graduate because I met my husband, my ex-husband. and. Uh, Met him in July, got engaged in August, and got married in November. No, got married in December. And 21 years later, got divorced. Uh, at what point, what motivated you to try uh, politics? Well, tell you the truth, after reading the paper, 
I would say to myself, God, I could do as good a job. And I was very active in a lot of uh, Jewish organizations, mm -hmm. uh, women's uh, ORT. I was active in uh, CARI. I was active in Hadassah. I was, you know, uh, so I was always busy. The house was clean by 10. The kids were clean. They had fed. They got to school. And I thought, so we lived in Lincolnshire. And when you come out of Queenswood onto Secor, this is even before the expressway was there. Uh, it was, it's terrible to get out, which of course I was hit there once, you know, so I know. Accidents all the time. And so I led a group of the neighbors with my youngest son attached to my leg with picket signs out in the middle of Secor Road. And um, we had police protection and uh, so you were a political protester first, before you were a yeah, politician. I still protest a lot. <laughs> um, and, uh, so how did that lead to? Well, what happened was uh, a man by the name of Mr. Perlmutter, I believe his first name is Norm Perlmutter, was the war chairman. And I'd gotten active, because Marshall was active in the party a little bit. And uh, we had uh, dinner. I met Jean Cook, and I was impressed with Jean and Mary, and they had just been first married. I, went Ray, I met Ray Neese, um, you know, uh, Norton Knipe, was, John Kelly was the chairman at the time. And I thought, well, I'd like to become a precinct committeeman. And I lived next door to Ted Stoll, who worked under the, who at the one time worked under Mike DeSalle as his director of insurance who went on to be president of some big, huge insurance company. But they lived right next door, and they were friends with Buddy and Jane Restivo. And, uh, and of course, I knew a lot of these people, like Abe Haddon and some of those folks from my dad, because he'd known them forever since he'd been in town for so many years. And um, so I became a precinct committee man. And then I wanted to be a ward chairman. And I don't, they never had a woman ward chairman before. So uh, Don Benzman, Dominic Montaldo helped me round up all the precinct committee people. And Mr. Perlman, Mr. Perlmutter was going to retire. And so I ran for war chairman and won. Well, that certainly frosted a lot of folks down there. On Was there ever any, any question that you were going to be a Democrat? No. You grew up in a Democratic household. Yes, absolutely. Not My an mother, option. I can remember on Columbia Street when Franklin Delano Roosevelt died, and I came home from Fulton School. I'd gone there for about a, less than a year, because then we moved to Parkwood. Uh, and my neighbor and my mom were sitting at the kitchen table crying. I can still remember. And why, why are you crying? Because oh, our president is dead. I mean, it was like it was like when John F. Kennedy yeah. was shot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was terrible. But I can also remember when World War II was over and everybody was screaming and dancing in the street. And of course, my father, when we used to have air drills, my father they pulled down the shades, you know, mm -hmm. and I'd have to stick my face out underneath the shade because I had to see what was going on. You're not supposed to be at the window. <laughs> Get away from there. I said, well, I want to see what's going on. Now, moving back ahead to your uh, first election, you lost your first election. I certainly did and lost my last. Uh, you're, I was going to say, you only lost two elections in That's your right. life, your first and your last. Um, what did you learn from that first loss in 1975? I think you ran for city council. I ran for city council. It was really interesting because when I ran, Bill Boyle was already the chairman, and my friend Jerry Chabler and Bill talked to me one day, and we were eating lunch. Well, I lost, and I, I came in like I think 11th, because in those days you had 16 people run. Mm -hmm. I came in 11th, and they said, "Oh, you got to raise more money." Got to raise. I said, "I was lucky to raise money for this thing." You know, in those days, $11,000 was a lot of money. And how I got to be a candidate in the first place was when Pam Douse decided to run against Harry Kessler for mayor. And there was an opening, and Ray, and Ray Neese called and said, get ready, you're going to run. I said, what am I going to run for? I was working for John McHugh as a clerk then. And uh, so I did what, did it all on my own. I had a terrible picture taken, but I loved billboards. And so I had this terrible picture taken. And it looked like I had this thing 
they did it in a black and white and a, and a uh, shade gray, you know. And I had a thing growing out of my neck. So Boyle sees it driving down on Madison, uh, down on the express, off the expressway. He said, take those boards down, you look like you have a growth. <laughs> and I did my red, goodness. white, and blue, and it was <clears throat> ridiculous. Not that I don't love my country, but I mean, it was too much. But you ran again uh, then in 1977, 77 and you and won, won this time, uh, right? Yes, I was yeah. the only woman that won that year, and I came in fourth. I had a Ray Kest, and he had a fifth. What a difference from two years prior. Yes. How did winning make you feel, contrasted to what happened two years prior? I wasn't as crushed. I was with a lot of really good people. Alice and Mel Resnick, we, were, we, we stood out in front of the old Jeep plant passing out stuff, and after a while it got so that Alice was running for counsel and I was running for judge because we were getting so confused. Uh, but you tasted victory finally in 77, and that had to be special. Yeah, well, I had a really great guy helping me, Bob Topolo, mm -hmm. who had been with uh, one of the glass companies here and helped me did my daisy and the black and orange for DeVilbus and and it won an award one year. The board won an award. And uh, well, was it your intention to stay on council because you left after two years to become Lucas County Recorder? I loved being on city council. Why was, did you? Well, why I just one term? Uh, Tom Rinders from your former homestead uh, always said, you know, if you got an opportunity, you need to take the opportunity. And um, there is an opening in the recorder's office because John McHugh is going to become the treasurer and Ray Kess was going to run for county commissioner, you know, the infamous musical chairs of the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. And I had worked in the recorder's office for like six years, from 71 to almost 87 when I took a leave. Well, I took a leave in, uh, no, yeah, 71 to 70. Five, and I took a leave when I ran in 75, and then I took a leave in 77. And uh, I went to see Bill Boyle. He says, well, we were thinking of giving it to um, Dick Doust. I said, why would you give it to Dick Doust? His wife ran against your, your, your candidate for mayor. I says, besides, he doesn't know what the heck a mortgage or a deed is. I do. I work there. And um, so he's, they were going to give it to Dick Doust, and he got up at the, at the meeting and said, no, she's getting it. And she's a vote getter, and she can win, which so, I did. And uh, eventually moved on, of course, to uh, Lucas County Commission. You're long they running. They didn't want me either. Pardon me? They didn't want me there either. <laughs> well, they got you. They got and me you're long running years. public service, right, and 17 or almost 18 years as yeah. a county commissioner. That ended in 2002. We might as well talk about the other loss in your political yes. career. You lost your seat to Maggie Thurber. Right. Uh, looking back on it, were you surprised? Um, if I can be perfectly frank here. We would hope so. Which I've never been known not to be. Uh, the Blade was not happy with me. I don't think that uh, I talked to Mr. Block or John enough about things going on. I think that that probably bothered him considerably. Uh, I think he has always wanted uh, Republican and Democrat. Don't forget, three Democrats had run it for an awfully long time. Uh, I think the last Republican was uh, uh, my good friend Al Hawkins. For a very brief time. For a very brief time, but I got to tell you, he voted with me on mm -hmm. a lot of things that yeah. uh, he, as a Republican, he probably shouldn't have, but he was very open minded. Mm -hmm. He was very open minded. He was very. Uh, thoughtful in his, in his deliberations. Uh, he was a great guy. Mm -hmm. And um, Well, it, it, it appeared certainly uh, when you first declared your candidacy for re-election, you would breeze to re-election. And we talk, you already mentioned one, one of the problems that cropped up, and we have to talk about yeah. that, that's the roofing job. You ultimately paid for I, a I roofing paid for job. I paid the roofing job, it, and it was a terrible roofing job. And my friend <laughs> Dick Moses would tell you today it was a terrible roofing job, on top of which the <clears throat> insurance company would tell you, too, because two years later they had to come in and spend another $4,500 to fix the mess that was the problem in the first place why I hadn't but paid. But at the time, the public perspective was oh, you hadn't was, paid for it. It was like I was getting a free yeah. roof. Well, that's, mm -hmm. if I, believe me, a free roof in politics today is like ridiculous because if I had wanted to be over many, many years, I could have been a partner privately 
in so many different deals that I would not touch. I mean, my friends, you know, would come before me on the plan commission. They talked about the plan commission too, which they didn't understand that I'm not the only one voting on a plan. And when the secondary plans come in, you don't know who the plans are for. You just vote on the plan. It's not named that so-and-so or so-and-so. Uh, but believe me, I voted against plenty of my friends uh, because the plans were not appropriate. Now, the other thing that hurt you that year in that race, and I'm sure you would agree, uh, you announced your intent to retire at the end of the year. Yes. To, in order to get your public Pe pension and right. then resume your job and get your salary right. as well. Like everybody else has done. Double since. dipping it's called and a lot of folks have done it. And a lot of folks have done it. I was the only woman that got called on it. I was the only one that got beat up on it besides Jack Puffenberger. And so with that combined with what the public surmised, you know, and the federal and the elections commissions came, the state election commission came in and said I did absolutely nothing wrong. They went through this whole, they took uh, uh, deposit, not depositions, but uh, history, mm -hmm. and we discussed it. They yeah. sent up a, a, an attorney from uh, Columbus. Now, I mean, you backed it, away from it. You didn't go through with that plan. No, I didn't go through with it, and I, and I got plenty of phone calls, including mm -hmm. some from Washington, that said, tell them to, you know, pound sand and get it. You deserve it. It's your pension. Mm -hmm. But many have done that since and continue to do that today. Mm -hmm. And some take three pensions. Now, you ended up losing, as you said, to Maggie Thurber. Not by a lot of votes. But, Not by a lot of but votes. But it was a very bad year. Mm -hmm. Now, if you think the Sorrento issue was bad, my year was equally as bad. But we never pushed it. You mean it. election irregularities? Yes, absolutely. They have found boxes of votes in closets. Uh, that was the year that they changed a bunch of precincts. People didn't know where they voted. I was out there myself doing, you know, uh, please vote for me. To this day, do you think you actually won? To this day, I, I don't know. I honestly don't mm -hmm. know. Uh, ironically, though, you lost to a woman after having blazed a trail for her, in a sense, didn't you? Yeah. But hey, that's the way it goes. <laughs> Did you ever consider running for mayor of Toledo, Sandy? Had I been younger, yeah, I would have. You mean at the time of strong mayor? Yeah, mm -hmm. I would have. I would have. I mean, I had a lot of people asking me. I have people asking me today, please come back. We need you. Even today, as we sit here in 2011, right? People are asking you what to run for mayor? No, run for mayor. Come back. Run for commissioner. You know, come back. Run for something. Okay. Which, uh, you know, is, is very nice for my ego, but um, that's not what I want to do. Now, one measure of a public figure's popularity is his or her designation as the guest of honor at a Toledo Press Club roast. <laughs> you had your special night. Do you remember that? I love that night. It was the best. And you know what? They sold out. It was the only time they ever sold out. I know. They roasted me once, and you never stopped reminding me that you had a bigger crowd than I yes. did. I was one of your roasters, I <coughs> yes, think. Yes, you were. And you were very unkind, as I recall. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry about that. It was Tom. a fun night. Um, yeah, yeah. You seem to have a genuine affection and concern for people. That's a nice skill to have, both as a politician and as a person. That was important to you, wasn't it? I mean, when we greeted each other today, you asked about my wife. You always do that. Very kind and thoughtful. That's just who you are. Well, I think that part of being, um, without sounding too terribly obnoxious. I think part of being a human being that if you've been around as long as I have that you have to take an interest in somebody besides yourself and something besides yourself. I mean like I can walk into a restaurant, I know, I know the waiters, the waitresses, know the boss, how are your kids? I mean but that's, I think that that's important. And it, not that it makes me feel so much but that they think how wonderful it is that somebody would remember their daughter, their child, their husband. Well, that's a facility that most people don't have, that the capacity to, to not just to remember or to inquire, but to remember names. You and, and Cardi Finkbeiner share that skill. Cardi's better than I am, though. I will retell you. I'm coming downtown one time when I, I think I was a councilman. No, I had just become state central committeeman. I wasn't even elected yet. I was, the, you know, the representative which then Bill Boyle and I had this huge fight and he would fly or drive down himself and I'd have to fly or drive down myself. <laughs> but anyway, uh, he stops at the light. He was running, must have been running against Wadd. He Wad. being 
Cardi. Cardi, okay. And, he's, and I'm stopped at the light <laughs> at the uh, end of Indiana where it comes up uh, at Washington at the light as you get off the expressway. And I had known him years and years ago because he was friends with a lot of my friends that went to Ottawa Hills and he went to Maumee Valley and they sort of, you know. Mm -hmm. And he comes up to my window and he says, hey, congratulations, Sandy Eisenberg, on winning that state central committeeman seat. And I thought, holy. He came thing. up to your car at an yeah. intersection and knocked on the window. Oh, it was a red light. That's Sounds how he campaigned, that's, too. That's how he campaigned, but he's a hell of a campaigner. Mm -hmm. He's a heck of a campaigner. Yeah. And as a good friend of mine, I mean, I didn't always agree with him. He'd send me these missives and they'd go and file 13. And other times I'd sit up in his office for a half an hour and say, you know what, I have other things to do, thank you very much, and I'd leave. But when he came down to my office, he was always treated on time. <laughs> <laughs> you had a very spe special relationship, obviously, with Cardi. I mean, you, he, he did run for mayor and did get elected. Controversial at times, outspoken always. Absolutely. Much like yourself. And I mean, how would you characterize that, that political and personal relationship after all these years with Cardi? <sighs> I'll tell you what, there's a lot of people that denigrate him, that laugh at him. I've done, you know, and I'm sure that he's probably been ticked off at me too on occasion, but he is one of the most honest in how he wants to serve this community. I mean, he, I mean, I don't think that he would, you know, take anything you know, how other communities have mayors that are on the take or this one's on the take. This is a guy that is strictly interested in yeah. how Toledo survives and, and remakes itself and becomes successful again. I don't think there's any question about that. What I wanted to ask you about next is uh, I'd like you to chronicle for us, if you could, what you consider your, your proudest achievements as a, in your political career. Okay, my political career. Uh, let's see. I think the Mud Hen Stadium that we brought downtown and revitalized downtown, I mean, it was the biggest first step. I mean, I can remember we had people all over looking for land and we're going to put this here and we're going to put that there. And I'm, I'm leaving a, a something and it must have been at what was called the Radisson, which is the Park Inn now. Mm -hmm. And I'm coming down Monroe Street and I'm looking on the left hand side and the county had owned a bunch of those buildings because we had bought them paid a lot more money than that it was worth, but we had bought them before my time. And I thought, what the heck are we, you know, playing this is around? In the warehouse district, yeah. basically. Yeah, and I said, what the heck are we playing around for? We own this property. We've got half the property that we need. So I said, we're just going to put it right here. This is where it's going to go. And it's adjacent to the Seagate Center. And, you know, there's places along the way that make. Mm -hmm. restaurants, bars, et cetera, in an entertainment center. And uh, so I went back to the office, I think the next day or whatever, and I says, you know what? Um, and it was uh, Pat Zahn mm -hmm. and Tom Gateway, Simma. Gateway Consultants. And said, we found, I got the land and this is what we're gonna do. And I called in, um, uh, at the time, it was Zinder Surchek. I called in my friend Sam Zinder, and I says, "Go as a beard. <laughs> Don't you just go to these different buildings and tell them who that you're you're looking to get an option on their property, and you can't divulge who the owner would be." Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I always said this even when I was on city council. As soon as they know that it's city, county, goes state, the price. oh, the price goes up uh, at least 100%. Mm -hmm. And so I thought we got a pretty good deal on all those buildings, and we went through and built the stadium. And, yeah. uh, of course, as, as they say, the rest is history. Yeah, here we are, oh, about 10 years in, ten, and it's been an immense success. This is the 10th year. It's been immensely successful. Uh, you know, the stadium itself won awards. The team has won significant honors. Um, it's just... It's really was, I think, the beginning of how to revitalize downtown. And then the commissioners, uh, 
uh, build Huntington Center and, you know. Totally revitalize that And area. revitalize downtown. Yeah. Um, some of the other things, uh, we built uh, a juvenile justice center, mm -hmm. built uh, the uh, Court of Appeals building. Moved which children's they changed, services. Ch moved children's services out of Maumee, brought them all downtown, mm -hmm. saved the first federal building, bought the old YMCA. I told Jimmy Holzmer, I says, he says, well, I don't think we should buy it. And I says, yeah, we should buy it for $325,000. How are you going to get a building? Because my father by then was in the real estate business, and I had grown up between selling shirts and them selling houses. You know, and I says, you got to own it. You got to own it. And, uh, and then we built, then we had on the work release, and then we've got, uh, you know, that whole block in there is part of the justice system. And it, it, I think that it's done a lot, you know. I just, I just feel that the county was in its heyday in those days. Were there, co uh, conversely, things that didn't get done that uh, you look back today and say, you know, those are your frustrations, the things that you might have liked to achieve. You, you have a long list of achievements, but what about the things that got away or never, just never got done? What oh. frustrates you as you recall those years? Well, I think that there were some things that I wanted to do with the courthouse. You know, we had that 150-year birthday party, and at the time, the limestone on the courthouse, mm -hmm. and it still is, and I think the commissioners hopefully will be doing something with that, but we could have done it years and years ago for a heck of a lot less money than I'm sure it'll cost them, mm -hmm. uh, and preserve that gorgeous building. I mean, and I used to look out of my office and I'd call down a facility and say, there's tree branches and garbages all over the front lawn of the courthouse, please send somebody to take care of it. Well, they mm -hmm. don't have somebody doing that anymore. <laughs> they don't have enough facilities people to yeah. do that anymore. Uh, how about women in government? Would you like to have seen more? I would have liked to have seen more. I would like to see more women on boards and commissions, mm -hmm. uh, much more diversity. I always felt that there were much more um, uh, African-American men and women that should be represented. Mm -hmm. I mean, whether it's on the symphony board that I sat on or on the zoo board that I sat on, that they finally got a couple folks uh, that were of diverse backgrounds. Uh, uh, Channel 30 board is, uh, is somewhat diverse. Uh, I just feel that you, you bring other people from different venues of life and you learn to understand them and, and, and you understand where they're coming from because their life experiences are going to be a heck of a lot different than yours or mine or yours. Mm -hmm. And so I just think that uh, it's worthwhile. I mean, it shouldn't just be an all white guy board. Mm -hmm. Uh, you encountered, and you've already described, uh, some religious uh, bias when you were a child. There and are then, no uh, Jews and, on anything. Right. And then gender bias you encountered, oh, yeah. uh, the good old boys network, which you had to crack. And, yeah, which, which you I did. crack, and then they all said I was part of the good old boys network. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if that's good or bad. I don't either. <laughs> <laughs> but you did achieve a number of uh, firsts, Sandy. Uh, first female Democratic Ward Chairman, which yeah. you mentioned. First woman elected Lucas County Recorder. Yeah. First woman elected a Lucas County Commissioner. First woman to be elected President of the Lucas County Board of Commissioners. Do you feel like a pioneer in that sense? I do, but I had a lot of really great mentors. Mary Jane Valiquette, my friend Mary Jane Gill. Um, you know, there were a few before me. Uh, you had uh, Mrs. Keebler, uh, who was on city council, uh, Maude Shapiro, who was on city council, Judge Galvin. Uh, those three women came before me. Uh, uh, Judge McElwain sat on the common pleas bench and was this phenomenally strong mm -hmm. woman years sure. before a woman ever sat on a common pleas bench. Would you make the point then that uh Gender, uh, in my view, seems so unimportant today. Yes, but that then, that is one of your major contributions. And, yeah, but then I think it, I think people look. Oh, oh, she'll crumble on this, or she'll be easy to get to, or you know, we'll make her do whatever we want. And um, it didn't it doesn't work that way, really. I think you assume that position of somewhat authority and power, and and. You really have to live up to what the public has expected you to do when they voted for you. Mm -hmm. what, wh how would you describe, Sandy, your philosophy of government? The bigger's better. I know you wore the liberal label proudly. Yes. Did you see government as the protector of the public? I think that the government, 
should be able to take care of uh, major services that uh, need to be taken care of. Um, I don't know how good a job they've been doing. Uh, I used to worship my government years ago. I don't know that I trust it as much as I used to. Mm -hmm. I think there's so many technological advances. It's like really like 1984 Big Brother is really watching you mm -hmm. and knows what you're doing at all times, whether it's the widget in your phone or the widget in your car. Right. I mean, I think it's scary. And, and I want to make sure that they can protect me. Mm -hmm. So when my boys go over in those F-16s out of Toledo Express, I say Godspeed. But mm -hmm. I look at where we're so spread thin on a national level. You know, we've got uh, terrible, terrible uh, climatic changes that have just devastated parts of the world. Mm -hmm. And we're there. We've got three wars going, Iraq, Afghanistan, and now we're flying over Libya. Mm -hmm. In this spring of 2011. In the spring of 2011. And then you have kids in New Orleans that still don't have a roof over their heads mm -hmm. and food to eat, a place to live, clothes to wear, schools to go to, jobs to have. I mean, is that I, government's I, function then to step in and make well, sure those are taken care of? I think they did a lousy of? job on Katrina. Mm -hmm. I think it was terrible. I think it was just terrible and to send them those those moldy trailers let those people live in those moldy trailers that are still molding down there. Mm -hmm. But it was okay for Brad Pitt and Oprah Winfrey and God only knows how many other celebrities went down there. Built streets, put in lights, put in everything. Built houses, thank you very much. Here's a, here's a couple million dollars and we built you a house. I don't know, why, are we so, why do we still have uh, 50,000 troops in Korea? Why do we still have 50,000 troops in Germany? The war has been over some 65 <laughs> yeah, years. Yeah, exactly. Come on. Let's talk a little bit about the relationship uh, between Lucas County and, this, and that 800-pound gorilla in the room, the city of Toledo. How would you characterize that? As a, you were uh, president of the board for a number of years and dealt with a strong mayor in the same building. Uh, Toledo being the dominant community, of course, right. in Lucas County. How, how did that work for you? Well, unfortunately, the outlying areas have never trusted the city of Toledo. And I tried to make some changes in that when Jack Ford was the mayor, when we were out in Berkey to put in water and sewer lines out there because it was so necessary because they were having so many problems. Um, we would have meetings in the sub, 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 sub basement of the jail. Uh, every couple of months for the Davis Bessie, we would have, you know, uh, uh, exercises if something would happen at Davis Besley, similar to what's happening now in, mm -hmm. in Japan. Uh, the city participated, but not, no higher level administrative official ever, ever came down. Ever came down. I think John McHugh might have come down once, but I'm not real sure. Mm. Nobody came. So, and then the, they would participate. Uh, when we had the uh, Criminal Justice Coordinating Council, Mike Navarre would show up. I don't even think he was chief then, but he would still show up and he had a couple of his uh, men show up to participate. Mm -hmm. But we always had the county officials at the table. Do you think that mistrust though still exists today between absolutely, the suburbs and the big city? Absolutely. Will it ever go away? I don't know. Uh, you know, they want to impose certain things that, through the city charter, they can do within the city. But I don't know that it's the role of Lucas County, we're talking 2011 folks, uh, to be the uh, benefactor for their trash pickup. I have trash pickup in Sylvania Township. I pay for it. I'm happy to pay for it. I don't think they want to be worried about if they're going to pick it up or not pick it up or if the street's going to be a mess. You know, I think it's terrible what they're doing to the Teamsters over there. I really do. Yeah. But um, I don't think that the commitments are met the way they should be met when you make comments in your, in your campaign rhetoric 
that you're going to do X, Y, and Z, and you end up doing A, B, and C. Now you mentioned the labor movement, Sandy. You had many great friends. Yes, in the I labor did. Movement. Many, Jack many. Free, among Jack Free, others. my very uh, dearest friend. Can you talk about some of those relationships? Uh, he was a great friend, a great mm -hmm. mentor. I loved him. He was a great part of my life for many years. Uh, there's um, Jack Sizemore, Joe Tomasi. Mm -hmm. uh, did you go back to Larry Steinberg? Did you know Larry? I knew his son, Richard. Mm -hmm. But I did not know Larry. Another great teamster leader. Yeah, for that, those well, who, yeah, I know. Yeah, for those who uh, might not for, know. For many years. Yeah. And, uh, but was, UAW leader, Walt, uh, Ballard and Murphy and so on. Yeah, but I knew, um, I knew Joe Tomasi. Mm -hmm. And I knew uh, a couple of the folks in the UAW. And of course, Lloyd Mahaffey, who came. For much then, of your political career, uh, Organized Labor was happy to support yes. you. Dale Stormer, the AFL CIO, mm -hmm. um, uh, my good friends at uh, the electrical IBEW Electrical Workers, uh, Local 500, which was my friend Billy Copeland and Phil Copeland's yeah. uh, home union. Um, you know, CWA, my good friend Norm McCraden, who's not with us anymore. But mm -hmm. there, the, the labor movement liked me. They didn't always agree with me, and I didn't always agree with them. But mm -hmm. But we got along very well, and they were very supportive over the years. As we sit here again, this is in 2011, for those who are watching at some future date. Yes. We are seeing an unprecedented attack on public employee unions, uh, collective bargaining rights, and so yes. forth, here in the state of Ohio. How do you feel about that? Well, I think the governor's an idiot. <laughs> don't sugarcoat it, Shannon. No, come on. I think that, but you know what? The people that voted for him this is Governor John Casey we're yes. talking about. The people that voted for him knew exactly, because he telegraphed and said everything that he was going to do, mm -hmm. and he is doing exactly what he said. Okay. So if those people are complaining in any way, shape, or form because they didn't vote for Strickland, and this man only won by 2% of the vote, then shame on them. Mm -hmm. But to just uh, pick out labor and, and unions and workers I mean, if you were only going to be interested in uh, your business buddies and the manufacturing companies and uh, all your cronies from the chambers of commerce, then fine. But that's not how the real world is. Mm -hmm. It's the cops and the firefighters and the guy that cleans your streets and picks up your garbage and the postal worker that goes out in rain, sleet, snow and, and everything else to deliver your mail. I mean, those people are entitled to maintain what they have fought for since the early 30s with the original strike at the Autolite. Mm -hmm. They are entitled to be not cared for or looked after, but they certainly can't work in the same kind of conditions they worked in those days. You know, you had uh, no labor laws for kids, you had no labor laws for seniors, you had <laughs> nothing that was going to protect anybody in, in any position. Mm -hmm. You didn't have any OSHA laws. You had to work six days a week and sometimes seven days a week and you sometimes work 12 hours a day. The unions are the ones that gave you a five day week. The unions are the ones that helped get you health benefits. They're the ones that helped everybody get health benefits, not just union members. You know, I mean, so people that support labor unions uh, I think feel very strongly in those that are labor oriented that those are rights that come to everybody. Mm -hmm. I mean it shouldn't just be the guy that's making seven or eight million dollars a year and isn't paying a drop of taxes like GE this year made 14 billion dollars and paid no taxes. I bet you paid more taxes. I'm sure I and did. And I know I did. <laughs> Sandy, you were married uh, a long time, 22 years, I think, yes. to, to Marshall Eisenberg. You divorced in 1981. Uh, did your involvement in politics take a toll on your oh, marriage? Oh, I think so, sure. Well, when I went to work for John McHugh as a deputy recorder, he says, well, you can work for a few months, you see how you like it. Well, it was funny when I, I worked for McHugh because originally he ran for sheriff, and he had these terrible billboards and whoever did the billboard had a very sick sense of humor because it said, put this man in jail. <laughs> Do you remember that board? And so we went out and tried to help him get elected. And 
and uh, we didn't uh, do a very good job. But I can remember being out on a flatbed truck at Sears at Westgate, and um, you know nobody showed up. <laughs> we had all these people. And then we all ended up at Sean's back door, which is on Heather mm -hmm. Downs in the old South End. And I turned to Marshall and I said, and everybody was drinking pretty good. And I said, why are we here? We don't drink. So we left. And then he became the county recorder. Mm -hmm. And uh, he says, well, see if you can get some folks to support me on the committee. I think he was talking about the Jewish folks on the committee to support him. And so I showed up, and I was a precinct committeeman at the time, and he got to be the uh, county recorder. And I said, yeah, I can really use a job. The man, he hired me. I mean, I had taken typing at UT when I was there, but my God, I was out of. So I was typing these thank you notes and thank you letters. And it was in the second week or third week of August, and I think he assumed uh, his, uh, his position early August, because I remember going to work for him in August of 71. And he said, how long? <laughs> I would have been ty still typing those notes, I can tell you, 30, 40 years later. He says, why don't I just put you at the counter, and you can do bring in papers and you know, file the stuff. And you know, I said, oh, that's great. You know, so I worked half some half days because my kids were out that summer, and every, every summer I try. He'd let me have half days, and then the kids got older and they didn't need me at home so much. And I was the first woman on the counter. While well, these folks had been there for 50 years, and they resented it. And then when I came back as county recorder, they really <laughs> resented it because the kid that was at the counter now comes back and she's the boss. Mm. And Marshall at the time says, oh, you don't need the job. I says, I like the job. So that didn't help. And of course, I was busy running. And you know, when you're on city council, you run from the day you get elected, you're running again. And uh, Two busy people. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and it, wasn't, it wasn't good, uh, which is funny to this day because Marshall and his wife and I are very good friends. Mm -hmm. We take vacations together. We go to dinner together. People think it's... My mother used to say, it's very Hollywood. We don't understand <laughs> it. My friends think it's unreal. But you know, when you have children, and then those children get married and have grandchildren, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not going to deny their father and their yeah. stepmother from see. you know, oh, that's yeah. ridiculous. Talk so about we your, all together. Your two sons, you had Michael and, and Dennis. Michael and Dennis. Yeah. And, um, and they've given you how many grandchildren? Michael has a girl and a boy. They're both, both boys are divorced, and I get along beautifully with my daughter-in-laws. <laughs> uh, I think that's important, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, you, you never remarried. Uh, no. Why? I don't know. I, I really think that guys are very intimidated by me. You think so? Yeah, I don't know. I've had friends over the years, one dear friend, and it never... I would love a, somebody, you know, to be a companion, to travel and stuff mm -hmm. like that now. But, you know, I have my own home. I can come and go as I please. Mm -hmm. You know, it's different. Had you, Sandy, had you not gone into politics, <laughs> uh, what would have been your likely career path? And I don't, I, I can't imagine that it would, would have been selling men's shirts for no, all of your life. God, what what, what would have become you. of you had you not gone into politics? I don't know. Maybe I would have opened a shop or something of my own, done something different. Um, I'm very much in respect. I have a great gift of gab like my daddy did. And uh, I don't know, I probably could have been a lobbyist. <laughs> but I loved politics. Because yeah. I think that that is the heart and soul of how this country runs. And not the negative connotation of politics. Yeah. But you play politics. I try to explain to people, oh, I don't vote. I says, I'm not interested in politics. I says, every time you go in a grocery store, you're playing politics. Because those politics in Washington or wherever determine what the price of your ketchup's going to be, or your sugar, or your coffee, or your chocolate, which is going up 20%. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, so I think it affects us all. You know, whether the street gets cleaned or doesn't get cleaned, the trash gets picked up or doesn't get picked up. You know, and there's bigger issues than that. It's police and fire protection. It's all politics. 
but you want a well-trained, well-organized police and fire department, you know. I mean, you know what's going to happen in the city of Toledo? The police, are, the police uh, folks that are, are getting out this year, there's probably about 30 or 40. They're going to retire because the drop program ends this year and they have to pick it up or lose a lot of money. I think it's clear you were not cut from the same mold as most politicians. We talked about your outspokenness, your, your frankness, you, your candor, you say what's on your mind, and you got reelected routinely year after year after year. Wasn't that a little unusual, though, for a politician, as we look at some of the people we deal with today? I don't know. I went to a psychologist once many years ago, and he was a friend, and he said, you know, they're either going to love you or hate me. <laughs> There's not going to be a real in-between there for you. <laughs> They must have loved you because well, you won re-election. I don't know. I think it's... Were there times you felt a little too outspoken sometimes for your own good? Oh, yeah. And wish oh. you hadn't said that? Oh, I wanted to extract that foot from my mouth many a time. <laughs> I did. I did. I did. But you know what? Um, I wouldn't have traded any of it for the no. world. I love what I did. And I, and, I, and I hope that I helped a lot of people. I can remember... A uh, young lady used to work at um, uh, Bud and Luke's, which was a restaurant many, many years ago on Madison Avenue. Uh, and it was wonderful homemade food. And in the old days, when my dad used to go there all the time, the waiters danced on the table and they'd break into song. And did you know that? They used to tap dance all around. And this young lady was waiting on us, and she had really had a lot on the ball. And, and I'd seen her several times, and we'd talk. You know, I'd get into her life, you know. I, I love to listen as well as talk. And uh, I said, you know, do you have so much more on the ball. Why are you here? You have so much more on the ball. Years later, my mother's in the hospital. And this girl comes up to me, and she says, you don't remember me, but... I was that girl at Bud and Luke's that you said had more on the ball. I'm your mother's nurse. Wow. That had to make you feel special. Oh, it did. It yeah. still sort of chokes me up. And I, a couple of other folks have done that. I know I gave a speech mm -hmm. at Whitney one day. I could have sworn these kids were asleep. And 30 years later, this young woman comes up to me. She says, you know, you talked to me once at Whitney, and you said the worst thing that you never had been able to do was complete college. And she says, I'm working on my doctorate. And it's all because of you said how important education was. Mm -hmm. how, would, <clears throat> how would you characterize uh, your relationship uh, with the news media? And I'm talking, you know, the Blade <laughs> in particular, Sandy, during your years in public service. I thought I always got along really well with the reporters. Uh, Mr. Block and I got along on and off. I have a great deal of respect for him. He's got a, he's got a, big, big operation. He, uh, he cares about this community. I know he does. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't always agree with his editorial page, even when you were the editor. Um, but I couldn't live without my blade in the morning. Yeah. So that says a lot. But, but they, I didn't always agree with it. They were kind of a watchdog looking over your That's shoulder right, and every yeah. other and public official And yet there's some shoulder. things that I think should be looked at and I'll call somebody down there now and then and say, gee, did you ever think of doing this? And, yeah. and well, they don't have the same kind of staff and it's a different ball game now. But. Former uh, Blade column <coughs> columnist Roberta DeBoer took some shots at you over mm -hmm. the years. And as you just mentioned, I plead guilty to doing the same yes, a few times did. anonymously in an editorial, of yes. course. Thick skin was pretty much a requirement, wasn't it? It was, and I showed a thick skin, but I would go home and <laughs> do my well, uh, and a couple of times brought me to tears because it wasn't true. Well, a couple of times it also brought you to pick up the phone and call me. Yes. And and uh, tell you, you would what rant I thought. about what I had written or what we yes, had written. I and did a very good rant. You did a good rant. And but what always struck me is when we finished that conversation, you'd all of a sudden make nice and say, "Bye, sweetie." I never quite got used to that. <laughs> Was it hard for you to stay mad? Yes, it is hard. I I have a very short fuse, but when it's over with, it's over with, unless I can get even. <laughs> <laughs> but I still do that. I can tell you uh, my dear, very dear friend, Larry Casal, who passed away last year. Mm -hmm. 
which was a terrible, terrible tragedy. tragedy. Terrible tragedy. He wrote in an article that uh, one of your reporters did. Mike Beasley said the same thing. Um, oh, what was her name? She went with her husband, Sam Rowe, to the Chicago Trib. Uh, Nara. Remember Nara? Schoenberg? Yeah, Nara mm -hmm. wrote a fabulous article on me. I loved every second and every, every word paragraph. <laughs> And um, they both said, she'll call you up, holler, call your name, scream at you, and then get done and say, OK, honey, what can I do for you? Well, after I get it off my chest, <laughs> and you know that I'm ticked off, then what difference does it make anymore? Yeah. In all your years as a uh, county commissioner, Sandy, we talked a little bit about this earlier. You only one, uh, one time. Did you actually serve with a Republican? And that was, of course, was Al Hawkins. And that right. was for a very brief time. All of the rest of your years on the county commission, all three commissioners were Democrats. Right. Should one party have all three seats? I think if those candidates are the ones that the voters feel would make the best commissioner, that they feel that they can entrust their county to them, absolutely. And if there were three Republicans, that were the best that they could be, and they could beat those Democrats, then... But shouldn't there be a... a, a how about a 2-1? Should there not be a, a loyal opposition? Somebody I saying, hold so. on a I second. Think, I, you know what? I think sometimes that would be fine, but until the Republicans come up with better candidates, then that's not going to happen. Um, you uh, left... Of course, you lost... Uh, we talked about the election you lost in 2002, and after a time, you did some television work after yes. uh, leaving office. And, and loved uh, it. Worked with Cardi Finkbeiner. At, uh, and we a, a and bit. we were up for two Emmys when I did that show, and then they did not get any nominations after I left. That must make you feel good. <laughs> but then you I must came have enjoyed back. that, though. But then I came back mm -hmm. and did uh, Channel 13, uh, Conklin & Company, for a couple of years on and off. Uh, so would you like to do some more TV? Or? I love TV. Yeah. I think it's great. Um, you also served the Lucas County Democratic Party as its chairman, right. chairwoman, in 2004. That only lasted nine months. Did not go well. Uh, we well, won that, a lot of races, but internally it was not fun. Well, as any student of local political history knows, the Lucas County Democratic Party often has a lot of in-house fighting. They have a hard time getting along with each other. We hear the A team, the B team, and all that stuff. Uh, were there times it must have seemed, while you were chairman, that you were trying to herd cats? Yes. <laughs> I'll tell you what's really interesting. Um, we had worked on this um, <laughs> to become the chairman almost six months. I think from the, from, yeah, because I got that appointment in uh, May of four, and mm -hmm. I served till February 14th of, nine, of 2005. That was my Valentine's present to them I left. Uh, we worked hard. It was Local 8, the Teamsters. I mean, we had meetings. We had everything down pat. We had those committee holes filled. I mean, it was going to be, and we were going to take it back, quote unquote, from the A team. Now, there was a lot of opposition to me because at that meeting, several of my <laughs> friends stood in line making disparaging comments about me and my career as a commissioner. I have nothing to be ashamed about it was my career as a commissioner. Nothing. You know, I did a couple of stupid things and shot my mouth off, but let me tell you, nothing. If I did anything, I think I improved the health and welfare of every county employee there, and not only them, but the citizens of Lucas County. So that bothered me going in. Then I became the chairman. Well, we had a wonderful year. Jerry Chabler and I raised over $250,000 that year. That was the year that Carrie and Edwards were running. Mm -hmm. We had a huge Democratic dinner. We had huge fundraisers that <laughs> hauled in dough. We had Carrie and Edwards down here. Jerry and I drove and went to uh, Carrie, and, uh, Carrie and his wife's beautiful home over there just outside of Pittsburgh. Um, I'm telling you, it was wonderful. And, uh, 
toward the end, though, uh, things didn't go the way some of the folks wanted it to go, and I felt that uh, Wade Kapsikavich should have been the treasurer because he was the one that had run. Mm -hmm. And there were those that thought that he shouldn't. And so that was sort of the beginning to the yeah. end. Now, we haven't talked about um, your nephew, but I want to. Yes. Uh, of course, Alan Connop's son, Ben, and, and Barbara's, Barb, Barbara's my son, sister Barbara. Ben, um, served one term as a county commissioner. Right. That had to be a proud time for you. He tried to do a lot of wonderful things, and uh, unfortunately, some of those things came to fruition and some didn't. I mean, he got cell phones for seniors. Now mm -hmm. they're doing it on television, mm -hmm. uh, pay cell phones mm -hmm. for seniors. Um, he did a lot of things for the dogs, puppies. Uh, I think he made this community much more aware of <laughs> animals. I mean, you can see that everywhere now. Uh, but he did a lot of things for a lot of folks that very mm -hmm. quietly mm -hmm. in the background that... Which is a big part of a commissioner's job, isn't it? Absolutely. It's a lot it's of, a lot of background. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what? In the old days, the commissioners didn't want their name in the newspaper. You know, they were just this quiet little group that went around and, you know, did what they were supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And Were you surprised he uh, did not seek a second term? No, because I don't think he felt that he was going to get anywhere. I mean, I really for Ben, but mm -hmm. I don't think he felt that his ideas were meshing with the other two commissioners. Uh, and uh, he felt that he wanted to make some changes, think out of the box, you know, do some things that mm -hmm. uh, hadn't been done before, merge some of the offices, do some of the stuff that's been done in Cleveland and in Summit County. Um, and I don't think he felt that he was going to get uh, uh, a fair play on it. I mean, right up until the end when uh, they knew he was going to be given an award by the animal, some of the animal mm -hmm. uh, organizations in the community uh, and the president of the commissioners. Had you encouraged him in the first place canceled to, to the run? Canceled the meeting so he wouldn't get the award in public. Mm -hmm. Now, that's mm -hmm. really tacky. Yeah. Had you encouraged him to run in the first place? Were you sort of a mentor? Oh, he would call and ask me some stuff, and I'd mm -hmm. tell him where, you know, historical secrets were hidden yeah. and where some money was that nobody was telling anybody where the money is. Um, well, let, let me ask you this, uh, Sandy. If you, if you uh, had the chance to be Sandy Eisenberg all over again, anything you'd change? Anything I'd change? Yeah, I'd finish college. At some point, I think that's about the only thing. I, you know, uh, you can't go back. Mm -hmm. uh, you can look to the future, uh, but you can't go back. Uh, but I've had a wonderful, wonderful life. I've had wonderful, loving family, loving parents, uh, loving ex-husband and, and kids and grandkids and ex-daughter-in-laws. And Speaking and of family, have you ever had a chance to go back, uh, perhaps to visit Russia or Poland, no. the homelands My of your parents? My sister Barbara and Alan and Ben went when mm -hmm. Ben was about six. Mm -hmm. Alan had a, was doing a seminar there, and they went back to trying to find, not so much in Poland, but in, in the Russian area. Um, have you retired from public life, Sandy, or could you be persuaded to run for public office again? No, but I've tossed over the idea of running for... Um, township trustee, but you know, after a while you get tired of the two o'clock phone calls in the, in the middle of the night, you know, like when I was a commissioner and they'd call and say, two o'clock, <laughs> they're still playing music at Centennial. Why are they still playing music at Centennial? I says, evidently they must have a contract till two o'clock. I mean, well, you want me to run out of bed and run over and say, Johnny Nor, you can't play anymore. I think they did want you to do that. <laughs> I think they did. Yeah. Uh, and fa people have asked me to run against uh, one of the sitting commissioners now. But it's not like it used to be. Yeah. You know, in the days of my early career and all through my career, if you said something and you shook on it, that was the deal. You not know, anymore. Not anymore. Not anymore. You mentioned phones. That's funny because in 1997 you did a dossier in the Blade, a popular column at the time. Uh, it's a good featuring, picture. <laughs> yeah, and you said what you would like to get around to doing one of these days, relaxing on an island away from, from phones. Yes. Have you had a chance to do that? No. 
<laughs> you hope to do that? No, but I'll tell you what, uh, the whole family <laughs> went down to Florida this, uh, around the Christmas holidays. Uh, Marshall and Kathy and Amy and Amy's boyfriend and my sons and my grandkids and we all stayed in the same area. Uh, and we just had a wonderful, wonderful time. And I don't think I used my cell phone once except to find out where somebody of our group was at the time. <laughs> Sandy, as we uh, wind down here, I want to ask you a question uh, looking to the future. And I, we talked earlier, we assume at some point down the road, a young man, a young woman is going to check this v DVD out of the Toledo Lucas County Public Library and, and hear what you had to say today. And I wonder if if that person, he or she, is looking to you for guidance, what would you like to say to him or her? I would say um, definitely finish your education as far up as you can go. Uh, I don't think you can get ahead anymore just on, you know, smarts and glibness and schmoozing, you know. Uh, finish your education. See and, and learn as much as you can about your area, the where you live. And not only that, but get out there and see the rest of your country. And, and if you, get, you have the opportunity to travel to different countries, do it. Mm -hmm. um, but be honest to yourself. I mean, if you feel really uncomfortable about something, then you know it's not the right thing to do. Okay. Sandy Eisenberg, uh, thank you very much for your, your leadership, your candor. My Most pleasure, of all, for Tom. your friendship. Yes. And, uh, and thank too. you for your interest in the uh, Toledo Lucas County Public Library Sight and Sound video history series.